Hello, here we all are. And welcome, everyone. Uh, we have Mark D'Antonio has been on about 50 times or so. 48. 48. You're exaggerating. <laughs> and, and Forrest Crawford, uh, who uh, I have not spoken to before. So it's it's really nice having you on the show. He's a cool guy. He'll right, enjoy right, this, sir. I think. I've been in hiding for years, so, you know. <laughs> at, at Dulcie Underground Base. That was what we were talking about in the last. We are talking about myths and things in the UFO world. But uh, thank you. So tonight we're going to be talking, uh, besides talking about UFOs, we're going to be talking about the conference that we're all going to be at. And I asked uh, Forrest how many times he has been. And it's only been 33 out of 36 conferences that you've been to. Amazing. <laughs> So, what uh, do you live right, right nearby there? No, I live in St. Louis, Missouri, which is about a six-hour drive from Eureka Springs. So it's not too bad. Ah, uh huh. And uh, I, I, the reason I am going, one of the reasons, of course, uh, I've always enjoyed hanging around with Mark, but also that I have heard uh, when I started the show, people had told me, you know, if you want to go to one of the great conferences in the country, go to this one. And I've been told that several times. And uh, there was a year when I remember George Knapp was there and I'm trying to remember who else. And uh, that was a year I almost went, but I couldn't quite make it. And I can't remember, it was probably snow or something like that. But uh, so that's a, that's a long run, long run of a conference. It is the only, the only other one in the country I think that's gone longer is the MUFON Symposium. Right, which uh, I'm actually going to be at this year uh, doing your job. You're the MC, and uh, for nice. the for Ozark. so <laughs> I'm going to watch you to to get pick up some pointers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I've MC'd one MUFON conference, and it was when I was the assistant state director of Illinois MUFON, and we had it in Chicago that year, and I was the I was the MC, so. I feel ah, for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go through the speakers first of all. Uh, Kevin Day and uh, Sean Cahill uh, both have been on my show. This guy, Mark something, the Antonio, no of course. Yeah. <laughs> Penny Kelly, uh, William, I'm not able to read as well here. Uh, Konoleski. Konoleski, thank you. Nick Pope, who I got to meet up in uh, for the first, no, second time actually. Uh, up in uh, Shag Harbor. I actually enjoyed hanging around. He's a fun guy uh, to hang with. Uh, Chad uh, Wainless, if I'm saying that right, from Lee Williams. And uh, there's a speaker panel. And it's a two two day, is it? I can't remember. Is it two day or three day? It's three it's days, right? Friday, Saturday, and part of Sunday. Right, right. So it should be a lot of fun. Really looking forward to it. Never been to that part of the country. So it'll be... Uh, be interesting. How many times have you gone, Mark? I think uh, that Nancy, who uh, is the ringleader, I think, uh, I think she's had me there two times now. Ah, uh-huh. Maybe Sounds three. About right. I think two. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I want to ask you, Mark, what are you going to be presenting this time? Well, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you right now. Um, I, um, I, through my friend Bob Schroeder, I've, I've uh, researched his UFO um, propulsion oh, mechanism. You yeah, know Bob. Great guy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A little soft-spoken, but you yes. know what? Yeah. He's, he's got the brain the size of a planet, right? That's what we make the joke. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know what? As an astronomer, I can really uh, appreciate that he he lends with his, his ideas, lend theories or lend credence to uh, how a UFO could actually get here, how an occupant from another world might get here across the vast gulf of the stars. That is something that is perplexing that we don't have any idea about and uh, ends most discussions. Well, how are they going to get here? The distance between the stars is so huge. Yes, of course. And that's very true. So how are they going to get here? They have to get here by basically circumventing the need for worry about the speed of light because in our four dimensions xyz moving through time light is the speed limit man you can't go any faster than that 
And you mm. as a physical body can't go any faster than that. If you go to light speed, you become energy. Uh, you know, Einstein's famous formula e equals MC squared that everybody knows about. That actually says an awful lot in that. In that. Uh, and that's actually the short form of the equation, okay? Uh, there's a much longer form of the equation. We're not going to go into any equations, of course, not at, the, not at the conference or here. But the point being that if we can defeat light speed, we don't have to worry about the speed limit of the universe, okay? Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the physics methodology um, in layman's terms that can explain how they can actually be here and get here um, vast distances, travel underwater at high speeds, travel in the air at high speeds, and leave no, no visible trace, okay? Mm. All ends up coming together and making sense. From mm. the shape of the UFO to the propulsion of the UFO. In fact, here's a little teaser for you. They don't have any propulsion on board at all. Mm. They don't. They don't have any propulsion. They don't need it. Just um, reflection? Oh, see, Force is one. Force wants to know. That's what I like about <laughs> it. Like, tell, me, tell me all about it. Well, it's actually a dimensional <laughs> shift. See, if we can get out of our four dimensions and move into this fifth dimension out here, Okay, which actually has a name within uh, this particular string theory variant called Randall Sundrum 1. We don't even care about that in the talk. But if you can get into that fifth dimension, well, now basically all you do is generate particles that pull your spacecraft out of the four dimensions that we live in into this fifth dimension that we don't live in, but where the universe is compressed around you the farther in you go the smaller the universe becomes so if you can go way far in when you come back out of that you can be light years away and never had never having traversed the space between point a and point b you just go into this fifth dimension and then pop back in at another location it's sort of like uh, an elevator you don't travel through the actual floors of the building to go from the first floor to the fifth floor you start on the first, the door is closed. The door is open again, you're on the fifth. Yes, you're traveling in the elevator, but ignore that. What if you could go through the floors in an instant? That's kind of like what this is. And their propulsion methodology, I, I call it propulsion, their shifting methodology is all they need to do. They just need to generate and, and monitor the amounts of these particles that pull them into this fifth dimension. The more they have, the farther in they go. The least they have, the, only if they go in a little tiny bit. So they'll, they'll probably oscillate. They'll probably do this the whole time that they're here. They're going to go between our four dimensions and the fifth dimension the whole time. Why is that? So that if they want to go underwater, well, then they're neither here nor there at any one time. So they could be hmm. all the way to the bottom of the ocean floor and not feel the ocean pressure. All right? So this is why, for instance unknown submerged objects, which I witnessed, okay, on a U.S. submarine decades ago. This is why unknown submerged objects can do what they do. Now, you talked to Tim Galladay, I believe. Did you not? Uh, Admiral, Admiral Galladay, did you talk oh, to Oh, yes, him? I did. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. You actually asked him a question about my experience that I had relayed to you. Yeah. And what was his response? Boy, you know, it's awful. I remember the conversation, but I just can't re remember. He did not yeah. say that he was, as far as I know, he didn't say he was familiar with that program, the fast movers. Right, but he did say that uh, he, he understood that everything that I had relayed was something that only someone that experienced it could actually relay. Oh, I see. Yeah. And that's okay. something that that's um, right. Yeah. I remember him saying something along those and, lines. And yeah. I, again, it's nothing I was looking for. I don't need confirmation of something I already know, you know, yeah. when I see this. Okay. That this was a, an experience I had, I can't explain. And I subsequently confirmed with the joint chiefs when I did a job for them that uh, with specifically with, with one of the chiefs that the program exists. And he said he couldn't talk about it. He was sorry. Huh. Now, now, Mark, um, <laughs> Are you familiar with, I, I can't, I, I was trying to look it up quickly, but I just can't. I'm, I remember, I believe George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell interviewed someone in the intelligence world that said they were actually able to get inside of a craft. You know, I mean, this is one of these stories, 
but he said there was no form of propulsion that they could see. I yeah. don't know. Did you hear that story? I, I haven't, but that's exactly what I would expect. Hmm. See, it's it's not propulsion that they use. You're not going to find an engine. What you're going to find is a particle accelerator. That's why they're round. <laughs> okay. That's why UFOs and flying saucers have always been traditionally round. And you can put inside a triangle, you can put a circular uh, particle accelerator because it's those particle accelerators generating these particles that take them out of our four dimensions. So they don't need engines. They don't need gas. They don't need fuel in the traditional sense. All they need to do is create these particles through atomic collisions, spinning uh, the, the particles in this tight ring in their ship. Now, our particle accelerators are miles across, I mean, over 20 miles yeah. for CERN overseas, right? The Large Hadron Collider. And yeah. the new particle accelerator that they added there called ATLAS, okay, all caps ATLAS, that particular accelerator in part is searching for these very particles I'm talking about, right? They're called Kaluza-Klein gravitons. And they're searching for the elusive graviton. And this graviton is something that could provide us with a tremendous amount of benefit when it comes to interstellar travel. Now, this isn't woo-woo science. This isn't science fiction. This is admittedly future science and, and future physics that we don't have yet, but it's not woo-woo. It's actually based on plausible theory. And that's what I like so much about it. And mm. when you think about it, it literally is, literally, is the only way that they could be here from there, mm. quite literally. Well, well I'm excited to hear that. I, I heard a version, not quite that, that uh, and Pine Bush, that you were actually talking about uh, the, the, the channels that they would probably travel in, like, uh, like maps. They mapped out like oh yeah they they have exit and entry points okay is that and what this so, whole thing tied in together with that uh, maybe okay but but the thing is um it if you think about it uh, these beings are of course more intelligent than we are it doesn't mean they're infallible it doesn't mean their ships don't get into trouble and crash and they die i mean they're certainly fallible you know a, a herd of elk is dangerous to you They'll kill you, but they're nowhere near as smart as you, but they can kill you. Fire ants can kill you with enough of them, okay? But they're not nearly as smart as you. So just like this to aliens, okay, we are dangerous to them for the same reason. We're dangerous hmm. in numbers. We're dangerous in, as individuals. They're not They're not all powerful beings that can just go and, and fry you, okay? They may have neurological control devices, yes, Um if you're studying biology, you certainly would. We'd have that now. We're doing that now with other creatures. We actually have these stunners and things like that to, and, and uh, um, uh, anesthetic, anesthetic uh, applications that we have. So we're in our infancy with that, but we're getting to that. We're going to do that, you know. And so when these creatures are plying the gulf of the universe, plying in the gulf between the stars, they're actually uh, – like cartographers they're mapping their exit points and entry points all across the universe wherever they go let's stay on earth for a moment let's say that you watch a ufo travel through the sky right and it goes at an unbelievable speed you know wow whoa look at that how is it doing that well the question is how could anyone withstand the forces going on in there right that's the first thing you'll say and that comes up often but wait a minute if you were in that ship, it'd feel like this. You wouldn't know. You'd feel nothing. Wait, what? How could that mm. be? Well, the way that could be is because you're not physically moving. You're shifting from our four dimensions to this fifth dimension and then back in the four dimensions, slightly ahead of where you were. See, they don't have propulsion. They don't have tires and wheels. They can't roll on roads. So what they have to do is the only thing they can do. They shift out and in, out and in, out and in. And when they come back in, they go a little bit ahead of where they last were. I know that sounds crazy and complicated, but it's actually quite simple and elegant. The accelerator is doing all the work. And so do you, think, um, do you think eventually that humans would be able to travel like that? I do, as a matter of fact. And the reason I do is because look at the work that Lawrence Livermore is doing right now. 
Okay, Lawrence Livermore achieved a sustained nuclear fusion reaction. Okay, not exactly. And okay, they didn't actually get out any more energy than they put in. Okay, in fact, they got out less than they put in. I get it. However, it was sustained. It was something that lasted for longer than it ever has. So we're getting close to sustaining a fusion reaction. Uh, now, why do I bring that up? Well, go over across the sea now to CERN again, to that Large Hadron Collider, the Atlas Project. And now, if you think about it, they're looking for these Kaluza-Klein gravitons, these particles, these elusive particles that could actually be the crux of shifting a vessel from the four dimensions into the fifth dimension and back again. But how do you make those particles? Go back to Livermore. You need a fusion reactor to do it. <gasps> Uh-oh. If now, if, if a Livermore is generating a fusion reactor and actually is successful, all right, what does that mean? That means you're going to end up uh, being able to generate these particles with a fusion reactor and then use the particles discovered by CERN to, to shift in and out of the four dimensions into the fifth and back again. You know, so I think uh, I, I think that this process. All right. Now, there's a whole lot of hurdles here. I understand that. OK. Synchrotron radiation. Right. You try to confine particles in a circular tube like we do. It generates this this synchrotron deadly radiation that comes out radially from the tube in all directions. You know, if the tube looks like this, OK, the radiation is going out radially in all directions. Right. So you got to you got to obviously shield for that. But the question is. How we have to do it in mile diameters, you know, miles diameter of our rings, these particle rings to generate these particles, going to make them faster and faster and faster until bam, we make a collision. Well, if you're advanced enough, maybe you figured out how to do it with a 30 foot diameter craft, which is the typical craft we, we hear about. And right. so your outer ring of your accelerator is in that 30 foot diameter. And where would you be? Right in here, in the middle. Right in the middle. Hmm. Right in the middle. Yeah, and, and that actually is consistent with what has been observed, reported, uh, uh, and, and theorized for a long time. So uh, I, I really think this is a revolution in not only interstellar travel, but in understanding. And so uh, as time moves forward, uh, it'll bear out whether this is true or not. I'll be the first one to say, nope, I was wrong. I'd be the first one and be happy to. I don't care. I'm on it now because it needs to be more recent. It needs to be researched further and, and more deeply for a better understanding of what's going on, Martin. You know, what do you think, Forrest? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is one of my favorite topics. So I'm actually looking very forward to your talk. I went to school to be a physics major just so I could figure out how these things flew. Well, I never got my degree in physics and I haven't figured out how these things, well, Actually, I might have figured out how they fly, but I haven't been able to build one or do the math. Yeah. So I, I love this topic, and I can't wait to hear you talk. Hey, check this out. Okay. Um, now, when people talk about them uh, not feeling our gravity and being able to move as if they have anti-gravity, right? What is anti-gravity? Well, by definition, what is gravity? Yeah, okay, but, but, but let's, yeah. let's, let's actually ask the question, <laughs> and we'll get to that, actually. That's very important. Um, and, and that, the answer to that question is part of the fundamental nature of what's wrong with our physics, because you know, as well as me, that we don't know exactly what it is. We know that gravity forms waves like ripples in the water. We've seen the ripples from colliding neutron stars and from, uh, you know, colliding black holes, mergers. We've seen those ripples in space time out in the universe, right? We know that we've seen it. So, we know that light acts like a wave. We also know that light acts like a particle. We know that we can assign a wave function to how electrons operate. And we know that we talk about them as particles as well. You see the theme here? All of our fundamental particles, and by, by and large, and all of our fundamental physics sees duality, wave and particle nature. Gravity's the oddball. We have... Hmm. And Einstein said we'd never see gravitational waves, and we have. Oh, Einstein mm -hmm. was wrong. Not yeah, wrong. He, he wasn't right about everything. Come on. He wasn't right about everything. But think about that. Okay. So we see gravitational waves now. So wouldn't it make sense 
that the gravitational particle is something that we would find as well called the graviton. We have photons. We have a wave of light. We have a photon of light, right? Mm -hmm. We have a wave equation for electrons. We have a particle system that we can describe an electron with. So it makes sense that for gravity, we would expect to find the particle side of gravity. The gravitons that are holding you to your chair right now, Forrest, for instance, and Martin, probably a, a little more so, uh, depending on his <laughs> latitude. I don't know. I'm a pretty chubby guy. so <laughs> well, I'm talking about latitude makes a little difference in altitude. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Latitude um, and attitude. Yeah. 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 Latitude and attitude. Yeah. The la attitude. <laughs> hey, that's good. So, um, but uh, when we talk about the gravitons that are holding us to our chairs right now, uh, if we think about gravi gravitons as gravity particles, then the ones we're talking about with the Kaluza Klein theory, they're 10 to the 16th times stronger than the ones holding us to our chair. So wait a minute, uh, wouldn't that destroy everything if they showed up in our atmosphere? Yes and no. Because well, when they generate these particles, what they do, this is part of what Bob talks about, Schroeder, um, is they generate micro black holes. We know micro black holes can exist. And micro black holes, they suck, but on bah, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they're also they're also very short-lived they only last for a short period of time just a few nanoseconds and then they pop out of existence so what good are they well if you keep a general uh, uh population of them around your ship then you did you, then you will see that you'll have a constant supply of these particles the more you put out there the more particles there are the farther into this fifth dimension you can go Okay, the le less you put in there, the then the less you go. If you if you turn it off and you stop going out into the there you go, the fifth dimension. Okay, <laughs> then, uh, he did that to me last time I talked about. It. I did, yes. <laughs> so if so if you can go back and forth from this fifth dimension like this, then what you will find is that to anyone watching you do this with their eyes here in our four dimensions, your ship would look like it's shimmering as has been observed. Your ship hmm. might look like it's changing color, as has been observed. Your hmm. ship might look like it's zipping really fast through the sky, as has been observed. It might be round because it's a particle accelerator, as has been observed. So now I'm an astronomer and I can talk about color changes as atmospheric scintillation. It's a process, it's something we know. I could talk about Seeing something here in the sky, then suddenly it looks like it's there. That's the autokinetic effect because your eye can't focus on any spot in the, in the sky very well. It it's a, yes. Right, exactly. It's an, it's an evolutionary issue we have. Okay. wasn't important to be able to do that, so we never really honed that technique. And I can explain uh, a lot of the other uh, issues, like where the thing seems to pop out of sight and then come back into view. Something on the edge of visibility. Sure. There's a lot of physical things that we see that we can describe in ordinary physics terms with ordinary explanations, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that that's the only explanation. And it doesn't mean that we can't share different effects with different phenomena. They do overlap. So it's possible, it's possible that everything we're seeing with these UFOs is something that uh, is the result of these Kaluza Klein gravitons being in use. Ta da! Yeah. Mark, are we talking oh. about um, um, magnetoelectric radiation, not electromagnetic radiation? Dark matter, dark energy? Um, no, you know, actually, for us, we're talking about, believe it or not, the only thing we're talking about is gravity. UFOs oh. use massive gravitational fields in order to move in this theory. Let me uh, throw this one out there, and I'll probably start a, I'll start a fight or send us down a rabbit hole. Good, road. good. I, yeah. I think that I I think that gravity might be a pushing force, not an attracting force. That we're not being pulled down to the planet, but we're being pushed down to the planet by an I, energy I that evenly permeates the universe in all directions, coming out of black holes. Um, I, I've heard bars, of that. Take your pick, and. Um, so whenever I think about it from a propulsion standpoint, from so a simple propulsion system to get around a planet, like you say, you don't need a propulsion system. All you need to do is neutralize or deflect 
that gravitational push a little bit, and now you have you have made yourself lighter. Actually, uh, I left out a very, very important piece too for us, and maybe this will align with what you're saying. Maybe it won't. Well, it's uh, time for a commercial break. Just kidding. No, you better not. <laughs> He's kidding. He doesn't mean it, folks. Yeah. No, uh, but the most important thing is that the other thing that these micro black holes do is the most important thing that they do, and I can't believe I didn't mention it. I think it was on such a roll that I forgot to mention it. Um, so I apologize. But the micro black holes do one other very important thing. They might pull in a little bit of the light, okay, and thus make your objects change color. They might, uh, they might make them shimmer and vanish because they're pulling in some of the light that these things are, are emitting. But they also are pulling in and eating, so to speak, the Earth gravitons. So in other words, Earth gravity cannot reach these ships. So that's why when people talk about them, they seem to sometimes act like falling leaves and just do weird motions that seem uh, very fluid. They seem fluid. very, very wrong, right? They just seem like, well, yeah, it looks like a floating leaf. Who could handle that? Well, the occupants don't care. They're shifting. They don't care. They're shifting in and out. You know, to them, yeah. there is no up or down. They don't have any up or down until they uh, mitigate the production of those particles so that they can set down on the planet. And by the way, when they do that, that's when they're vulnerable. I was going to say, how could they crash, I guess, connection with the planet? But uh, um, thank you for all that, Mark. And uh, I understand, you know, I mean, sorry. I, I wanted to, to talk to you, Mark, at some point, um, because I think that the web is possibly changing some science just mm -hmm. by some of the things that they're discovering. And but that that we'll talk at a, a, another time. But I, I think it's really interesting. And maybe the co cosmological constant was actually accurate. And who knows? I mean, yeah. the, these all these things that they're trying to figure out. But I want to know who Forrest is in uh, Forrest. Uh, if you would, uh, it sounds like you've had an interest in the UFO topic for a long time. Did you have a personal sighting or anything or just an interest? No, I did. When I was 10 years old, I saw a disc-shaped craft uh, land in a farm field about 120 feet away from me. It was about 35 feet in diameter and kind of looked like the Pizza Hut logo and had a short, stout sort of antenna-looking thing in the center and some windows around the the canopy part of it and uh, while i watched it landing gear came out and it sat down on the ground and my best friend and his parents saw it also we were driving back from hardin illinois near uh not uh just north of pierre marquette state park if you want to look on a map and figure out where this happened and as it turns out there's tons of ufo activity in that area historically and mm. uh, so i saw this thing land and uh, even at 10 years old i was like that ain't from around here you know Hmm. And I got interested and got involved when I was 13. I was collecting books. I gave my first speech on propulsion theory and detection methods when I was 18 years old here in St. Louis. Oh, well, before you before you move on from that, can you describe the rest of that particular encounter? I mean, did you see the thing take off or anything like that? Um, no, it was uh, we we were driving back from uh, like a. My friend's uh, uh, uncle had a house near the river and we were doing, you know, a barbecue all day. And we were driving back at night and we were seeing this glow moving around like behind the hills, and behind the trees. But we couldn't see what was causing the glow. But it was weird enough that at some point uh, and this was in the in the late 60s. So there was a lot going on. And we even joked that oh, it's probably one of those UFOs they're talking about on TV. Well, my friend's dad was ex-military. And uh, it was odd enough that at some point he pulled over next to a field where we could see the glow that wasn't moving so we could get out and see what it was. And uh, so I was the first one to start getting out of the car, saw it hovering about 15 feet off the ground. And then it, the landing gear came out and it sat down on the ground. They started getting out of the car and saw it. When my friend's dad saw this thing, it scared him more than I've ever seen a grown person scared. And he screamed for us to get back in the car. And that's when the Nash Rambler exceeded its design capabilities. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah wow. he floored it. And we were literally just screeching on these little country roads in the middle of the night to get away from it. 
And he would never allow either of the three of us to ever talk about it again. If we brought it up, he would get violently angry at us. Wow. And um, so that was the only that was the only thing that happened that night. Uh, that was enough. <laughs> it, oh, it, yeah. was, it was. It turns out that years later, um, I found out that other things had happened earlier in the day that even as a lifelong UFO researcher, um, abduction researcher, you name it, um, I did not remember these things that had happened earlier in the day until I allowed myself to be hypnotized. I was actually trying to recover uh, to see if there were any more memories about that night that you're asking mm. about. Because that's mm. one of those you go, well, if you saw it land, something happened. Well, it mm. turns out it didn't, but something happened earlier in the day that I had not remembered for 30 something years. And uh, um, there were other objects that we saw um, earlier in the day. Uh, so it really deepens the mystery quite a bit, I can tell you. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. And so it sounds like right away you had an interest in the topic. If you, if you did a talk when you were 18 years old, that's pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, it was at the UFO study group of greater St. Louis, which at the time was probably the largest, um, monthly UFO group in the country. And, uh, the people that would show up at that, at that meeting, just, you know, uh, on a whim, would be like Dr. Hynek, uh, Walt Andrus, um, the Lorenzens, uh, you know, wow. uh, Ted Phillips was here in Missouri. He would show up. So that, on a monthly basis, any one of those guys could just walk in and sit down in the audience. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty so, amazing. Icons. Golden age of ufology. Yeah. I have yeah. to just ask you two this question because I love this show. Have has any <laughs> one of you watched this? I'm very familiar with this show. <laughs> yes, uh, I love yeah, this show. I love too. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a riot. Uh, you end up uh, just loving this dysfunctional, childlike alien yeah. that uh, really doesn't mean to do harm, but he doesn't care if he does harm. Anyway. If you don't do yeah. what I want, I'll eat your children. <laughs> That's what we do on our planet. Yeah, yeah right. You know, on my planet, faces. we leave them out on the ice to die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow, ah. you, you are watching it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. So, uh, yeah, getting back to you, Forrest. Um, so, you've had this interest for a long time. What other types of involvement have you had in, uh, like, involved in MUFON and things like that? Yeah, whenever I was a teenager, I started doing investigative work, and mostly it was carrying stuff for these really cool old guys of ufology, you know. Um, and uh, then, I, like I said, I went away to college to be a physics major, literally to try and figure out how they flew. Really? Wow. I, still, I mean, you were serious about that. Oh, yeah, I wasn't kidding about that. I went yeah. to IIT in Chicago uh, on a Navy scholarship to be a physicist. They wanted me to do reactors for the Navy, and I went, no, no, we don't mm. want that. But um, and then so then uh, eventually I got involved with uh, MUFON as a field investigator and then uh, assistant state director. And then when Tom Stoltz um, died, I became state director of Illinois MUFON for 11 years and then passed it on to Mark, one of our good friends, Dave Marler. Uh, so I was the state director for MUFON from 91 to 2002 or three, something like that. And uh, I, I actually was on the staff of MUFON as the computer specialist, and I designed the first database that all of the paper records from Walt Andrus's garage were yeah, entered into the computer cabinets. for the very first time in a database that I designed. Wow. So, yeah, that was a long time ago. That, yeah, Walt used to run MUFON by file folders out in his garage. It was yeah, hilarious. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. But, I knew him when he had dark hair. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah he was an awesome guy but yeah he was not he was not good at filing uh so uh, yeah we got it all <laughs> on the computer and uh now you can search all that data um i guess thanks to me uh, if i'm gonna brag about something i may you well may do that, you right? may you deserve it <laughs> yeah and, and, except at the moment i mean uh there's been a denial of service attack on mufon and our 
our case management system is down oh, yes. and, and the FBI is involved actually trying to find the culprits. Yeah, it seems oh, like wow. a hack oh, of some true. kind. Yeah, yeah, it's been a it's been a wicked hack. So yeah. that's just you know the crap we deal with. So Mark, here's a question for you. Uh, when will you be following up with the Hudson Valley saga? Yeah, I, uh, I answered why, but in the chat. But oh, no I see. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, there's no one yet that wants to actually do that because um, hmm. that, that costs money uh, to actually foot that research. I want to do it. I've been wanting to do it since the day one. I just finished working with that producer that was on that show uh, on another program. And, um, you know, so hopefully, you know, he'll get the bug to do it again because I think it doesn't have to be a show. I mean, I don't care. Just research. Mm. You know, mm. but we need someone to underwrite the cost of that, you know. I and we'd see. have to get Ben yeah. out here again and stuff, you know. And uh, get get but, those Oak Island guys. I think they're about to find that treasure. They're going to be looking for something to do with that. They'll show, need so. something to do. Yeah. Well, they're always <laughs> about to find the treasure. They're always about to find it. I was no, talking I, about that the other know, day. Oh, like, they found a button. We'd make so much fun of them, but I can't stop watching that stupid show. <laughs> well, then it's a success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It is. Sure, it that's is. right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many seasons it's been, and but at least nobody's died yet, them. right? <laughs> nobody's died well, yet. Well, right, that's it. One of them needs to take a fall so they can that's find right. the dang treasure, right? Yeah. And it always yeah. killed me when Travis, I love Travis, but he's on that show. He went on that show, and he's talking about stuff, and I was like, Travis, why don't you call up one of your buddies and get some gravity anomaly maps so that we can see underneath the ground with that good government technology and point to right where the stuff is. I don't know. Yeah. No, that or would be or just do a gravitational anomaly study like the oil companies do. Exactly. You know, there was exactly. in reality there was very little actually uh, buried treasure. You know, th those guys did all like there was so much more they were involved in, and for them to take the time to make such an elaborate trap and all that, I think it's well, something happened there, but I don't know what it was. Maybe we're going it was down a, a rabbit hole here, aren't we? Yeah, uh, yeah we just, better stare away. Just a yeah. small one. <laughs> if they dug up a UFO, that would be cool. But I don't think yeah, so. it was the UFOs did it. Yes, yeah. So uh, <laughs> this has been this has been a lot of fun. And uh, Forrest, I'm going to have to have you back on the show for a regular episode. It would be great to to talk to you. And I would love uh, to do that. I got I got some great stories. I can tell you that. Well, let's hear one of them right now. I'm going to put you right on the spot. Okay. <laughs> All right. Best ca I'll get, and I'll give you the bullet points. And this okay. is a week long discussion. You bring the beer. I'll tell you the whole story, but I'll give you the bullet points. Okay. okay? Um, most interesting case I ever investigated was here in Missouri. Uh, we call it the Oscar case. This was a guy that, uh, that Stan Friedman actually turned us on to this guy. Uh, he heard about him when he was uh, speaking at a conference in Florida. So he passed the information to Bruce Whitteman, who used to be the state director for Missouri MUFON. Bruce called a couple of us up. We went up and we found this guy with nothing more than the name and the town that he lived in. And um, he claimed to have been involved in a, he was on a Delta squad back in the late 50s, was uh, involved in a crash retrieval operation where they recovered an intact UFO that had minor damage on the inside, two dead aliens, one live alien that was trapped on board the ship. He was the, his crew were called in to do security around it. They were stationed at the Comtray Peck submarine base in San Diego when they got the call. He said they got, they went underground and got in the tubes, what they called shooting the tubes. They got in the tubes and he snuck a watch on. They they always make you take metal off when you ride the tubes, but he snuck a watch on because he wanted to see how long it was going to be to where they were going. It was a little bit less than 20 minutes from San Diego, and they got out at my, or near Minot Base in North Dakota. If you do the math, that's 2,000 miles an hour underground in a, in a tunnel, okay, Jeez. back in the late 50s. Um, his crew formed security around the craft. Some guy named Dr. Bear used some sonic equipment just like in the movie, The Bamboo Saucer, and the side of the craft looked liquid and it opened up like an iris. He went into the craft. There was a live alien pinned against uh, one of the walls because the inside buckled when it crashed and pinned his leg. He telepathically communicated with the, or the alien telepathically communicated with him, and they came in, freed the alien, 
And uh, because he could so easily communicate with them, he was he was um, uh, dubbed as the liaison. So he communicated between the scientists and the military and the alien. They did. They tried to ease the alien's pain with opioid um, stuff, which had no effect on its physiology. But they went ahead and did experimental surgery on it anyway. At one point, he um, he took the side of the alien and pulled his service revolver and said, you're not going to hurt this guy anymore. They immediately removed him from the project, debriefed him in, in a military hospital in out east, I want to say, maybe Virginia, uh, for like three months and then honorably discharged him. And uh, he had been in touch with the aliens, or they've been in touch with him ever since. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so... We went up, we did a seven year long investigation where we went up and interviewed this guy about three or four times a year. And uh, every single time we went up to talk to this guy, something weird happened. I saw UFOs, we heard strange things. Um, just, I again, I could go on for about four hours and just tell you the weird stuff that happened while we were up there investigating this guy. And, and remember, uh, Martin, I'm going to be with him. <laughs> so i'll get you, to the and, scoop I'll, and you yeah I'll, buy, I'll get to the scoop buy yeah. me some, buy me well i'll tell you the story have me on the show i'll tell you the whole story uh yeah that's so, fascinating like never heard never heard any part of this one so yeah, so that's uh, fantastic yeah. it, it's it's suddenly <laughs> completely relevant again because it dovetails into all of this whistleblower stuff everything this guy said we were either able to verify his military career, the guy he reported to, all this kind of stuff. And then I can tell you through personal experience, I don't think the guy was lying because weird stuff happened to us every time we went up there. Hmm. And uh, uh, so, um, yeah, wow. it's a fascinating story. Excellent. That's one of them. That's one story. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm looking forward to, to meeting you, Forrest. And uh, it's been a real pleasure having you both on. And uh, Mark, I'm can't wait to hear that, the propulsion again. And uh, actually, I have been in touch with Robert Schroeder, yeah. uh, Bob Schroeder, and uh, he is uh, going to be back. He wants to do the show in person, which makes it kind of difficult because I have to be, you know, he wants to meet up in Massachusetts, so it's a little tricky for me. But other than that, we'll. Uh, oh, we'll that's right. You're no sure. longer in. You're not in Maine anymore. No, uh, uh, no, I'm now between New Hampshire and South Carolina. So yeah. back and forth, but, uh, okay. but so we'll Martin, see. Did I, did I hear you correctly? You're going to be at the conference. I will be there coming okay. in, I, uh, uh, going on a cruise the day, uh, the week ahead and flying from Florida to, uh, to the Ozark. Jet uh, Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Keep your camera going when you're on that cruise. You might have some pictures to show us. Yeah, I did. The first time I went on one of those cruises, I thought for sure I saw a UFO Ended up being a, a plane pulling a banner just very far away. And boy, did it look great, too. And uh, if it hadn't turned, I would have thought it was. But thank you both so much. And lo really looking forward to seeing you coming right up in a few weeks. And yeah, uh, all too. right. Thanks so much. And take care. All right, guys. Thank you. See you later. Right. See you, Mark. Bye. See you, Mark.